Whether it's ancient combat or modern sport, winning is what it's all about. I have to conquer a skill that I know absolutely nothing about. But how do you win? The history channel car is history. This man has learned the hard way. Now he's ready to show you. fighting to protect our families or defend our land. We're fighting to entertain you, the people. This is the Roman Empire, and we are gladiators. For seven centuries, thousands of us, sometimes tens of thousands, have died every year for Roman spectators. We train in huge schools of combat and fight in hundreds of arenas where killing is a game. How do the gladiators really fight? How can they survive? How to win as a gladiator? All right, guys, we've brought you here to the city of Nîmes in southern France for one reason only. This, the original Roman amphitheater built in the first century AD. You are slaves, and you are owned by that man up there. We're going to train you as gladiators. You will fight and die for your owner's personal entertainment. I think that seems reasonable, don't you? We're going to take you in there, give you some Roman clothes to wear, throw some swords at you. Come on, let's go. What a difference 2,000 years make. Now the team has nothing but simple tunics on their backs. Surrounding them is the Nîmes Arena. Nice place, isn't it? Fine fresh air filled with sunshine. Who cares if it is soon to be filled with thousands of spectators screaming for blood? In the Roman Empire, you'd all be invited to watch these men at work. Husbands, wives, don't forget to bring the kids, witnessing the slaughter of thousands every year. Of course, we could be talking about modern television, but in the arena, the deaths were for real. By 100 BC, the Roman Empire was filled with millions of politically restless citizens who demanded entertainment. Wealthy men seeking public favor were only too willing to provide it, hiring managers to turn their slaves into gladiators. The trainer and manager of gladiators, someone like me, was known as a Lannister. The name is derived from the word for butcher. We were universally despised, the pimps of death. We supplied a network of arenas and schools throughout the empire, and the most successful of us made a fortune. I want you to choose weapons, shields, helmets. Try them on, come on. Your owner and I will be watching your progress. This was the first step in what became a lavish public spectacle, fueled by a steady supply of Rome's criminals and prisoners of war. As the trainer, I discuss the combat potential of each slave with the owner. Their lives are in our hands. We've made the decision which will decide the life and death of each of you as a gladiator. There were many different types of gladiator. One of the earliest was known as the Samnite, from a tribe that the Romans defeated in 308 BC. And our Samnite, is you. The types of Roman gladiators were stylized versions of the different warriors the empire faced over its long history. The Samnites were mountain dwellers, known as fierce warriors who went into battle with heavy armor. The gladiatorial version carried a large curved wooden shield, which became the traditional equipment of the Roman legion. <laughs> All right, how does it feel? Heavy, especially the helmet and the shield. Well, it's a very effective defensive system. Now, in your other hand, you hold your weapon, and here it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding, that's it? That's it. That's too small, I well, can't do anything with that. I'm sorry, but you see, the great thing about a short weapon like this is it forces you not to rely on your defensive armor. You must fight aggressively, getting close to your opponent. And you're going to have to, because we're going to match our Roman with a Greek. A hoplomachus, scaled-down version of the Greek hoplite, the classic spear and shield warrior. And that is you. So, go on, go get dressed. The original Greek hoplites depended on fighting in groups, round shields overlapping in the tight line of a phalanx. In gladiator form, however, the hoplomachus is forced into open combat, one-on-one -on -one in the public arena. All right, now you'd either have a Greek sword or a spear, like this one. 
Now we have exactly what the Romans were looking for, two historic types. One with a short weapon but heavy defensive armour, the other with a long reach but very little defensive ability. This is the perfect balance. The Samnite has to get in close to get to grips with his opponent. The Hoplomachus has to try and keep him at a distance and kill him there. As a spectator sport, the fine points of gladiatorial combat were recognised by the crowd as much as a Hail Mary pass or quarterback sneak is today. Every move and every piece of equipment had its specific reason. All right, you guys. All right, OK. Get that round now. Now, even after a few minutes, you can see immediately how this combination of weapons and armour has been very carefully chosen. The idea was both to balance the combat and to prolong it. For instance, the target areas, the head. Any slight blow to the head can be serious, if not fatal. So it's well protected, the face, sometimes the throat, and all around the head with these heavy helmets. These weighed about 10 pounds on average. That's twice as much as the Roman trooper's helmet. But then he wore his all day, and you're only going to last for 10 minutes in the arena. Your real target is the chest here. That's protected by nature. This strong rib cage covers those vital organs, so only a really good thrust is going to penetrate through there. Unlike the stomach, even a slight wound here is going to end the fight, because you cannot fight with a cut-open stomach. So you have this really strong leather baltius. Sometimes uh, the baltius was reinforced by mail or metal. Next, the sword arm. Again, even the slightest cut here is going to end the fight, because with a cut arm, you cannot fight with a sword or a spear or any weapon. So this was always well protected with a, a leather manica, or sometimes something like this, a, a manica made of steel. There's no point wasting a blow on his shield or on his helmet. You may stun him for a moment, but while you're doing that, he'll be thrusting with his spear or his other weapon, and you've had it. We now return to Conquest, here on the History Channel. So far, we've seen our team learning the skills of two gladiator types, the Samnite and the Hoplomachus. Next, we'll add two more. The Mermilo was named after a fish-shaped crest said to adorn his helmet. Our Mermilo will be protected with fasciae, padding wrapped with tough bands of leather on both legs and right arm. All right, you will be armed with this, the Gladius Hispaniensis. Brought over by the Romans from Spain in the 3rd century BCE, it became the standard Roman infantry weapon. Magnificent thing. Next, a Thracian. Fast and light, quick on his feet. They were based on the light troops of the Greeks, who became auxiliaries in the Roman army. <laughs> All right, here you go. First, you have a small rectangular shield called a palmula, and you have the most interesting weapon. It's this curved thrusting sword called a sica. You're going to have to learn how to use that. A quick thrust was the speediest, most efficient use of the sica. And remember, because it is such a short weapon, you have to get in close. Equally important was what he held in his other hand. The shield. This wasn't just used defensively, it was also used aggressively. It would force your opponent back, force him onto his back foot, as well as defending yourself, you could actually attack with it, use it as a thrusting weapon in its own right. We're beginning to sense the challenge and excitement of the Roman arena. But here, with wooden weapons, we sometimes forget. At the end of this game, the loser might be dead. So if death is a pretty good bet, how were men persuaded to do this? For a slave, it may have been his only hope. Escape through glory or death. He was trained in the mind as well as the body, and each new gladiator or tyro swore an oath. And to die by the sword. These men became members of an elite, a brotherhood, almost a religion. They were encouraged to think of themselves as living legends, above the rest of the people, concerned only with survival and death. The Roman aristocrat Cicero admired them. He said, these slaves with nothing in the world can show us all how men should die. They marched out in front of a crowd that sometimes numbered 50,000 people, all roaring together with every eye on them. The adrenaline rush must have been incredible. The only sure way to live through the experience was by winning, by defeating your opponent. Those who succeeded repeatedly became champions, sportsmen at the absolute peak of their game. They were megastars, the few who survived. 
The fact is that large numbers of men actually volunteered to become gladiators, as many as one in five. Now, these were free men seeking their chance for fame and fortune. Some of them were even noblemen and senators. Indeed, the Emperor Caligula forced many Romans of the highest rank to fight. Now, this was considered an absolute public disgrace. But you all came to watch, didn't you? The next gladiator on our team was one of Caligula's favorites, the Retiarius, who exemplified Roman kinkiness. They fought without helmets, and the emperor enjoyed watching their faces as they died. To meet him was the Secutor, meaning chaser, developed specifically to fight the Retiarius, providing the best possible show. All right, now the Retiarius is armed with two extraordinary weapons, a net and a trident. Now, you're the lightest of all the gladiators. Your whole kit's no more than about 18 pounds. The Secutor has a, an ordinary short sword and uh, this shield, pretty practical job. But the really difficult thing about your kit is your helmet, very heavy. And as you probably noticed, you can't hear much or see much. This is the throwing net. Now, once he's ensnared, you need to hit him quick before he cuts his way out. So for this, you use the trident, the weapon of Poseidon, god of the sea. Now, this is one of the few weapons of the gladiators not to see military service. Now, there's one thing most important about the net. If ever you get it trapped around his shield, around his arm, anywhere, and he still has his sword arm free, you're in serious trouble. Now, here, there's only two things you can do. First, you can get rid of the trident, draw the dagger, which the retiarius is always allowed to have, and cut the net away, or, having got to this position, you get in close under the shield and stab him with it. Either way, your chances of survival are very small, so do not let this happen. Two equally matched gladiators could fight a prolonged battle, but usually one or the other would become exhausted or outclassed. Right, stop there. He's hit. The crowd would be screaming, Habit, he has it. The referee would step in, separate the fighters. Now, with this armour and these weapons, you're very unlikely to kill a man straight off. What you're doing is wounding him, and that's what the crowd wants. Once you've wounded him, he's much more likely to be wounded again and again until he is forced to raise his left hand with one finger in submission. Once he's done that, the crowd go wild with frenzy because this is their turn. Now they can be either the killers or the saviours, and that's their decision to make now. The defeated man's fate was decided by the emperor or the sponsor of the games, called the editor. But nearly always, he listened to the crowd and made his decision. It used to be thought that the thumbs up was a signal that the defeated man should live. But it may be that we've underestimated quite how nasty the Romans were. It seems that actually, this was a signal to the victor, and it meant something quite different. Conquest will return in a moment, here on the History Channel. We now return to Conquest, here on the History Channel. In a Roman arena, a wounded gladiator is down. He awaits the judgment of the crowd, life or death. Now, if it's death, it's better for you to do what's expected. So, sit him up. Now, you're not only trained to fight, you're also trained to die. Now, keep your helmet on. It's very unfair for him to have to see your face as he's killing you, so keep your helmet on. Right, no consideration at all. If you have any strength left, you put your head against my thigh like that. Now, at this point, you draw your dagger, and you've got two choices. You can either come through here, straight through the collarbone, down across to the heart, or this way, straight across the neck, sever the spinal cord and the jugular in one go. Either way, if you do it right, he'll be dead before he hits the ground. But for the victor, there were cheers and rewards. A laurel wreath might be placed on his head and his hands filled with gold. And just occasionally, a star gladiator would be awarded this, the rudus, the symbolic wooden sword. That meant that he was not only rich with his winnings, he was free to spend them. And that is what we are all fighting for, the tiny chance to be rich, famous, free and alive. <laughs> The arena at Nîmes, where our team train as gladiators, was one of at least 200 amphitheatres devoted to such fighting throughout the Roman Empire. The deadly sports were among Rome's biggest businesses. In one series of gladiatorial games, the Emperor Trajan had 10,000 fighters. There was something for everyone. 
Men fighting with bows, with two daggers, lassoes, charioteers, horsemen, lancers, clown fighters with whips and wooden swords. And then there were the specialty combats. The Emperor Domitian liked to watch fights between old men, between dwarves, between the physically disabled. And he was especially keen on fighting women. Female fighters were highly prized. They either fought each other or against men who were deliberately disadvantaged. One woman, for instance, against two men, each with a hand tied behind his back. The arena was always charged with the eroticism of death, and never more so than when women were in combat. As the games grew in importance, so did gladiators. The best men were in great demand and could earn huge sums. Their portraits were painted in mosaic and mural. They were swooned over by teenage girls. Their techniques were admired and debated. They had affairs with rich society ladies. They were the Derek Jeters and Michael Jordans of their day. On the other hand, Come on! most remained slaves, the lowest possible caste of society. As gladiators became more expensive, fight managers filled their rosters with half-trained criminals. Now, even minor offenders found themselves damnati in ludum, condemned to the games. Even those who refused or were incapable of becoming gladiators did not escape the arena. The Noxii were condemned criminals executed by wild animals or by gladiators, which at least was quick. Among these were Christians, regarded as traitors for refusing to sacrifice to the emperor. It was public butchery in the most literal sense. <laughs> It's easy to forget that this place was in business for about 300 years. An absolute minimum of 200 gladiators would die here every year, probably the same number of executions. That makes 120,000 human beings who were slaughtered right here. We are literally fighting in their footsteps. So are you all enjoying your lunch? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, after two hard days in the arena, you may wonder what you're doing here. And I'm going to tell you, tomorrow we're going to hold our own version of the gladiatorial games. The actual event was called a Munis. It lasted two or three days, and it was like a huge rock festival. There would be advertising, painted billboards, herald in the streets, program sellers everywhere. Huge event. The day before, those who were about to die were invited to a public feast. And that, my friends, is exactly what this is. Because tomorrow, only one of you will survive. We are going to take your weapons. Could you hold that, please? Yeah. And we are going to uh, lunt them and cover their blades. And then you are going to fight completely unrehearsed. And I will be the judge. When you are hit, and it's a question of when, not if, I will decide how bad the stroke would have been had these weapons been sharp, and your owner will decide whether you deserve to live, but only one of you will achieve victory. Is this for real? Yes, it is for real, and I drink to the health of those about to die. And I hope you sleep well. Conquest will return in a moment, here on the History Channel. We now return to Conquest, here on the History Channel. The day has arrived. I am once again the Lannister, trainer and fight manager for the wealthy Roman who owns the slaves we have turned into gladiators. And here they come, each one a professional athlete, each one knowing failure may mean death, and only victory means survival. Gladiators, are you ready? Gladiators! Fight! All six of our gladiator types are represented, fighting in three separate pairs. We have the Samnite with his heavy shield facing the spear of the Greek-inspired Hoplomachus. Our heavyweight Mermilo is up against the speedy Thracian. And the net-bearing Retiarius fights his chaser, the Secutor, who in these particular games is the first to be hit. I stop the fight between these two as we turn to the others. 
the Hoplomachus and Samnite are locked in violent struggle. But as so often happens in the arena, the end comes suddenly. In our third pair, the Thracian speed fails to subdue the Mermilo. The Thracian lunges, falls, and his opponent strikes him down. I will ask the owner which one of you deserves to go into the next round. Now the rare opportunity for a defeated gladiator to live. We need four fighters for the next round, so one of these losers will earn a gladiatorial wild card. The other two will die. The owner has decided. You will live. Finish them off. The fighting begins again in round two. It doesn't last long. The Samnite is hit by the quick spear of the Hoplomachus. Then, the Mermilo falls at the hands of the Retiarius. And now, there are two. Which one will kill again? Gladiators, fight! Continue. A second injury. A third. The Retiarius is down. But what I see is a brave man who has faced death under my guidance. Is there value in yet another killing? I think he's fought well. Do you think he deserves to live? No. Kill him. The more fights a gladiator won, the greater his confidence grew. But what were his chances of survival? Well, forget it. Practically negligible. The huge majority came to arenas like this and were slaughtered. Our team have trained how to win as gladiators. But most gladiators were trained only to die.